One, two, three. <laughs> Welcome to the Mental Reps Podcast, featuring your host, Brian Wright. You're in Cobra Kai. What's that like working with Ralph Macchio? You're, again, you're back on set. I guess this episode is returns. But I mean, it's again, it's a childhood thing, man. I mean, I'm staring there at Johnny and Ralph. Daniel LaRusso, and you're staring there going, holy shit. What's even more crazier is I'm part of the LaRusso family. This week's episode is sponsored by Build Right Incorporated. Do it right the first time. By the way, in my first CSI New York tracksuit, weeds, tracksuit, witness infection, (laughs) tracksuit. And even in Cobra Kai, there's a scene where I wear a fucking tracksuit. I'm always in a fucking tracksuit, man. Now fade out that fresh ass beat and let's start the show. Welcome to Mental Reps Podcast. I'm Brian Wright. What's up, fam? How we doing? I hope everybody is happy and healthy. This is uh, part two of my chat with comedian Brett Ernst. This was a lot of fun. I like letting these conversations just go wherever they're going to go. I really enjoy hearing comedians' takes on politics, like religion and and life as a whole. So we get into all that quite a bit uh, over the first half of the podcast. I loved it. I think you'll really appreciate his takes on things uh, as well. But hey, if it's not your jam, just uh, scoot to about halfway in and we start talking music, family, how he got started in the business, some more of his crazy (laughs) Hollywood stories. He's had a really cool career, man, in uh, TV shows, movies. We talked about the stand-up business, how he's uh, navigated its changes, how the broadcast industry has changed where it's going, uh, hanging out at the comedy store, Mitzi Shore, uh, his really cool, pretty special relationship he had with Rowdy Roddy Piper. It's good shit. So please enjoy another set of mental reps. But first, yeah, that's right. It's pandy time. I want to tell you about Build Right. If you're looking for local sanitization services here in South Florida, you've got to call Build Right. They are state licensed and insured, offering local sanitization services that kill COVID-19 along with 99.9% of all bacteria and viruses. If you're an essential business and need to keep your property and employees safe and virus-free, let them help you stay in business. Keep your employees working. They offer services for aircrafts, boats and yachts, public transportation, restaurants, gyms, offices, homes, cars, trucks, and more. It's kind of like you're running them through a big Purell machine. And now they're offering free sanitizing to vehicles of all first responders and medical professionals, which I think is pretty damn cool. So give them a call, 954-651-0932. That's 954-651-0932. Build right. Do it right the first time. We're back. We had such a good conversation that we had to put a part two to this, man. Well, I, I think I'm wearing the same shirt. I put it on for continuity, but you didn't put yours on, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I know. I already threw mine in the washer, and I was like, oh, because I didn't think. I was like, I'm not going to make them wear the same shirt. You're such a fucking class act. You're like, you're wearing the same shirt. <laughs> I think it's the same one. It's uh, This was our sponsor for our podcast at All Things Comedy. Oh, nice. JR's Park. JR's Bar and Grill at Seaside Heights. When we used to do, you're on the list. And I still use them for things. So I wear them every chance I get. They're the best, man. Really? I don't, I, I've never ever been down the shore, but it's uh, – there's a place at Seaside Heights. It's uh, it's called JR's, but there's a place called Maruka's Pizza that is connected to JR's. Um, and it's unbelievable. One of the best tomato pies on the boardwalk. Dude, I was going to ask you, what were what are some of your favorite Italian spots down here in South Florida? What do you like that? Because I know that you take that shit seriously. We got like Maggiano's, which is kind of a bigger one. Maggiano's is a chain, and it's not yeah. a bad chain. It's not a bad chain. Um, I'll tell you what's good and uh, is Anthony's Coal Fire Pizza. Uh-huh. Okay. And uh, I love, uh, uh, what's it, Anthony's Runway, too? The the one in Fort Lauderdale. What's it called? Oh, shit. 54 Runway. Uh, yeah, Runway now. 54. You're talking Paul Castronovo. That's uh, all his buddies. Paul Castronovo loves all the Runway, movies. Anthony's Runway 84. 84. Yeah. yeah man. Anthony's it's Runway 84. Stuff. And you know what's a great spot? It's been in Fort Lauderdale for a while. And they serve great Italian food, even though it's a steakhouse. It's Tropical Acres. What the hell? On Griffin that? Road. Tropical Acres. On Griffin, on Griffin and Road. what? Griffin and what? It's on Old Griffin Road. I, I couldn't okay. tell you. All right. You go down there. Uh, you, you can't miss it. It's been there for... Almost 60 years. 
Papa go, ah, dude, I feel like an asshole because I know that I, I feel like I should know it, but I don't. All right, I'll check that shit out. It's been there forever, man. I mean, it's like one of the original uh, spots down here, but they have good good Italian food, man. Anyways, no, you're... but yeah, so, uh, and I love La Spalda's. Uh, oh, La Spada's. La Spada's. Yeah, that place is fucking phenomenal. Dude, they've uh, sponsored a radio station, uh, The Shark, down here for a long time. And I know the owner. She's like a really, really, really good person. So shout out to Nat, uh, Natalie Griffin. She Those is, sandwiches are unbelievable, man. The dressing they put on there. Oh, and also Doris's Italian market's good too. Yeah, they're good too, man. But dude, the way that La Spada is like they take that extra layer of meat and they put it on top yeah. of the veggies and they fucking throw that shit around. Like they do not fuck around there. Dude, the sweet peppers on that sandwich, oh. they're strong, man. And those voodoo chips. Come on, son. No, that's really but, good stuff. But we're just talking Florida. If we're, if we're going New York, I mean, I got spots everywhere. Of course, I, I can imagine. Have you ever been to the homeland? Have you ever been to Italy? No. My yeah. brother went. Me either. You mean Jersey City? <laughs> yeah, I've been to Jersey City. No, yeah. uh, no, I've never been. My older brother was there for about a month. Yeah, dude, I've been and wanting to go my entire life. I want to go there and... Ireland, obviously, because of Ireland. Those are my three, Irish. man. Ireland, Italy, and Israel. I want to go to those three. Dude, yeah, man. Go ride some camels and shit. Three eyes. Three well, eyes. I just think it's cool if you go to Israel to see where all three major religions were, all in that one little area. It's yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah, dude. You know? Yeah, that I'm would fucking be sweating, cool. dude. I know. I, I, I'm a little worried I've got my AC unit on, but I'm pretty sure... After I can uh, fix it and post the audio, so I can get that little hum in the back. I tried turning it off, bro. Nah, it keep it on. It man. ain't happening. It ain't fucking. Happening. I just was working out. I was doing my little prison workout. I figured <laughs> I'm on house arrest. I might as well. <laughs> and then I uh, jumped in the shower, and I'm still sweating. Yeah, I know. I just did the same exact thing. So, dude. All right. Well, let's fucking. I know. I got a little like uh, under tit sweat going on. It's really attractive. You can't see it, though. You can't see it. Gravy or sauce? Gravy or sauce, bro? It depends. I mean, there's two different things. We say gravy, but gravy is usually on Sunday, and it's got meatball, sausage, the pork in it. I think, you know, a good a sauce is something different. A little marinara if you're making a pizza. You know, you don't put gravy on pizza. You know what I mean? I think the difference is in – we call it gravy no matter what, but there is a difference. The gravy with the meat and then also, you know, if I'm making a, a – a sauce. I don't use the the paste. Uh, okay. I mean, okay. I'm just okay. making something lighter. Like my um, what's the one that's like the whore sauce? The Italians like the it's like a whore sauce. My ex fiance, her mom used to make it all the time. Good. A uh, whores. Whores. Like they would say like the um, what's the oh Italian? you mean a putnesca? Putnesca. I think it was it was something like that. Putnesca. You mean because a Bhutan is a whore? I think that's what they were trying to explain to me. I'm trying to remember. They said it's the whore sauce. They're like, it's the whore sauce. It might be a putanesca because a putan is like a whore, but putanesca is great. That's made with sardines, capers. Um, it's really the way you make it is it's it's really simple. But you gotta you gotta make sure the sardines are, are thin, and then when when you you you're, you saute them in the olive oil with the garlic and they melt. It's really good. And black olives. Uh, see, that's see now I get why they didn't go into too much detail on that because I'm such a of the like, fish. I'm such a pussy when I, I wish I liked fish, dude. I really, really do. I just can't do it. It's a texture and taste thing. And you know, obviously in Italy, Italy, that's a very like fish heavy. There. Well, what uh, do you eat? Shrimp? No clams. See, I like shellfish but i like it hot like i don't love every once in a while i'll do like a little shrimp cocktail but i like it cooked and hot like if it's breaded or you know fried or something like that i love lobster with a little butter some crab legs with butter but i need it to be hot like i had a lobster roll and it was cold and i spit that shit up once do you eat tuna fish fuck no i know i, I hate at least it. that's consistent yeah <laughs> i know it doesn't matter, dude. I really hate that about myself. I really wish that I liked it. I just have you ever had sushi? I have sushi that isn't sushi, like California rolls and shit. I can't do the raw fish, bro. It's a texture cool. like salmon. That fucking texture that's at the roof of your mouth after you eat salmon. It just you know, food. I'm very fortunate, but you have to eat the right fish. You know what I mean? You have to eat the right fish. See, I've tried swordfish. I like swordfish because that's more of like a steak. And yeah. I had some shark that was pretty good one time that I liked. 
some uh, white fish. But most of the time, I can't do it. Believe you don't me, like I hate the fish, it. About... The fish taste. You don't like that that fish taste. I, I got you on that. The fish it, taste it, it, and the texture. See, the thing is, and the problem with a lot of restaurants, a fresh catch, you can tell. If it's even a day or two, it's going to have that taste to it, and it's not good. So it's good to buy a fresh. Do we eat uh, uh, calamari? That's I'm not going to say galamad like a jerk. Ga- ga- I, I um, have. It's not like when I see it on the menu, I'm like, oh, shit, we got to order that. I'm like, eh, if somebody orders it, I'll have one or two. Yeah. But it's got to be like fucking fried or whatever with uh, yeah, that the sauce. Yeah, the say it's fried. I like it. I like it every way. Man. Yeah. I yeah. like the way, um, is it Portuguese or Spanish way they do it? They, they, they grill it. I can't think of what, what it's called. It's really good, man. You just cut the, cut the meat. I had something with mussels that I didn't think I was going to like, and it was so well prepared. I was like, damn, that shit's good. I like the mussels if it's well prepared. I cook all the time, man. I love to cook. Dude, that was in my household. Like, growing up, we were always, like, planning the next meal. We would eat, and, like, we were starting to plan the next meal while we were eating. And uh, Me and Verzi were just talking. You know Paul Verzi is? Yes. Paul. So me and him were just talking about, about this uh, the other day, how Italians are the only group of people that talk about food while they're eating food. And they're telling <laughs> a story about food. And the one thing that's really annoying is, like, if you were at – and I don't do this. I think it's very rude, but it's just a common thing. Like sometimes people will eat something and they'll be like, oh, how do you eat that? Or you're like, I don't eat fish. And they're trying to convince you that you haven't tried theirs. Yes. Uh, you know? I know, And it's man. like, see, you're eating the wrong stuff. You don't know You don't know what you're eating. <laughs> That's my whole life, dude. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> like, okay. You got to try my mom's trout. I'm like, uh. Uh, dude, just one time. And if you don't like it. And the next thing you know, you're like, I don't like it. And they put you in a situation. It's Where you got to be an asshole. And it's like, dude, ah, uh, man. You know what I started doing for a while and then it backfired one time. But I just started telling people I was allergic. Oh, that's great. Because it just makes it a lot more simpler. And it's just like, man, I can't, I'm allergic. Oh, okay. And it's like, yeah. damn, that worked. And one time it backfired. And um, God, dude, I... Yeah, man, I really do wish that I liked it. I just can't get it in myself. Like, and you know, being Irish Italian, all we like to do is like eat, drink, curse. But like the Irish part of me is very much meat and potato. Like, I got this very like basic. Dude, that's good palette. food, man. If you get to an authentic Irish pub, man, there's some good food there. Dude, have you it's ever been to hearty. the field down here? The field on Griffin. No, it's called. I'm surprised you know. Where, I'm surprised you don't know where Tropical Acres is on Griffin. I'm I know, <laughs> I know, man. Oh, listen, man, I don't know, dude. Sometimes there's little things that if you if I don't see it for a while, you know, I really do think that nowadays, what is it that every two days you're generating more data than we did in the entirety of mankind through the year 2000? I think really? that there is just so much shit being thrown at us now. That other and, things are getting moved out. Yeah, I'm, I'm having to delete shit out of like my portable hard drive or put it in like a zip file where I need like that extra key to get into it. It's not as readily accessible. It's in there, but it's like, eh, I, I really think that there's something to that. So, so the field is authentic, like they. Yeah, they are all I, uh, Irish, man. They got that badass, like legit, real deal Guinness on tap. And so, uh, soda bread, I love the soda dude, bread. Dude, they've got everything there. The corned beef and hash. They've got like cloggers that come in there and dance like a real deal Irish band. And uh, it's it's the shit, dude. If you, I'm about to try it, man. You gotta try it. I'll take you one day. Maybe we'll go get beers there. I know you mentioned we'll go get beers sometime. Did you grow up religious? Uh, yeah. I mean, I I grew up in the Catholic Church, but you know, I I, I went away from it, and then I came back to it later in life. Yeah. So you're, yeah. are you active or are you like an active? I mean, I, I observe Lent and, you know, I'll, I'll go to church. I just don't go on the holidays, but I don't go every Sunday, but I, I usually try and pray every day. Yeah. That's good, man. That's good. Well, so, yeah. yeah, dude, I think anything that makes anybody a better person. And I, um, I grew, grew up very religious and I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater either. I think that the organized religion aspect is a little tough for me. But I respect that. Like, you know, anybody who tells you they know exactly what's going on here, again, I think is fucking lying to you. So that's where faith comes in. But, like, if you use your faith or whatever it is to make you a better person, dude, I don't care if you believe in fucking green men on the moon. 
if it makes you a well, great person, that's great. And then it, it goes on the definition of a better person, you know, and, and the good thing that with, with any type of a philosophy or with religion, if that what, what a good person is should be defined. Because, you know, to somebody, a good person is just, you know, about them, mm. bettering their selves, mm-hmm. you know. And, and, you know, and, and certain religions, uh, almost all of the uh, monotheistic ones put God before man and put man before themselves. You know what I mean? Copy that. So I, I do feel that there is a, a benefit to it. The, the, the big misconception, though, that, you know, uh, I, I think what a lot of atheists, staunch atheists and religious extremists share in common is they really don't understand it. Yeah. You know I, mean? I, I think yeah. they really don't understand what, what, it, what it's about in, in essence, you know, and, and it's not about being right or wrong. I mean, it's it's like a lot of people think that religion and science are at odds, and it's not. I mean, not mutually you know, exclusive at all. I no, agree with the that. Big Bang Theory came out of the Vatican. Yeah, man. So did um, uh, what's his name, George uh, La Pietra, whatever the fuck is the guy who came up with the cosmic egg theory. Oh, and then okay. uh, Mendel Mendel did uh, all the the genotypes. Mm. Oh, you know, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the, the Temple Beth Israel, not Temple Beth Israel. What, what's up, Mount Sinai, um, St. Jude's? They're on the forefront of cancer research. It's not like you know, it's they're in the Stone Ages. It's, and think it's, about it's, how much charity work that all the churches do. I mean, and again, it, was, it doesn't mean because you're reli- just because you're believing God doesn't make you better than like you can have an atheist that's out there doing quote-unquote god's work yeah. or going around being a, an altruistic person and then you can have a, a, a person that reads the bible every day judging and people is, and judging shit, yeah. people and, and they're, they're, i mean the worst thing you could do the biggest sin on the planet and the most hypocritical thing to do is to judge anybody i mean any any religious person you see on a corner telling somebody they're going to hell okay to base judgment as god would is the ultimate sin Dude, I couldn't agree more. They cancel themselves out. I couldn't agree more. Like Augustine, Tertullian, Constantine, these are all the guys in the first, second century that inter- even introduced the idea of hell in the first place. So that's a form of being able to control people. You give them little reward systems, and then you give them a worst case scenario. Well, Constantine, if you don't follow, Constantine was Constantine was a little different because he he saw he saw the way the Christians were being persecuted. Because remember, the church doesn't really establish until about three hundred A.D. Right, about three hundred years after Christianity, yeah. And uh, prior to that, they were murdered. They prayed in secret. You know, was it? It was when Constantine t- drew the sword to defend them. Is when it starts to get go the other way. Yeah. Well, I think you know Augustine I mean? and Tertullian were more of the um, maybe philosophical. Ma- I don't want to say manipulators because I don't fucking know. I don't think that they were, but that's the thing. I, I, I just think they don't know any better. I mean, you, you have to understand it. You're, you're, at the time. you're looking at society with 21st century goggles. You know, it's, it's almost like calling the, uh, uh, a caveman a misogynist. It, it, you, it, it's, it's, a, it's a social evolution. And, and we get mad everything. enough about people comparing LeBron to Jordan, let alone <laughs> fucking Constantine. <laughs> no, but like even religion and it's—I mean, even medicine and its infantile st- stages was brutal. I mean, they were bleeding people out, drilling holes in people. I mean, when you look at some of the science, unfortunately, uh, war is always a catalyst for technology and also science. You know, and when you look at the experiments that were done on on people with the Germans and. Doing, da- I mean, let, let's be honest. Every institution has its its infancy in, in in animalistic behavior. It's just you know we're not we're not that old as a species. Yeah. We're pretty arrogant, you know. Yeah. We're just pretty well fed now, so we can we can look back and say, okay, they shouldn't have done this four hundred years ago. I'm not saying you condone it. That Christopher Columbus was a real prick, huh? Yeah, it's like, dude, you, uh, put it in context. Yeah. You know, yeah. put everything in context. Yeah. And there's not one culture, one religion, one one philosophy that has that. The problem is mankind. That's the problem. That's the problem. It's human man. nature. Man. Yeah. I have a couple atheist friends that get so upset and they get mad at God and religious people. I'm like, well, if you don't believe in God, 
you're mad at God, think about who you're really upset with. You're upset with man. Like, that's yeah. who you're really pissed off with. And, yeah. you know, Carl Sagan said, anybody who's an atheist knows a whole lot more than I do, because then you know for sure. So I think there's a certain level of, I don't want to say arrogance, because I understand where some people would not believe, and with all the horrible shit that's been done in the name of God, again, by man. By man. People are going to have some very confused, Listen. conflicting feelings on shit. Charles Manson used Helter of Skelter of the Beatles to justify his, I mean, you, you know, you, you're, you're going to have deranged people. Um, now, the or, getting back to the organization of it, the way it, you have to remember, it was weak, people hid, Constantine drew the sword, people followed, then it became a powerful entity, and then it gets corrupted. Yeah. And in order for something to be corrupted, it had to have been pure in nature. You, you don't corrupt evil, it's already corrupted, correct? Mm. So... So if something is corrupt, that means that at one time it was pure. Copy that. That's you know? a, Okay, I like that. That makes sense. So then you go back to the basics. So I'm not going to allow another person to dictate to me how my, um, my, my relationship with God or with Jesus should be dictated by some, some maniac on a corner yelling or some angry, smug person who doesn't fully understand the way religion works. So I, I learn on my own. I, I, I read on my own, and I'm, I, I've studied. I've studied religions, man. I, I've studied everything from Taoism to Buddhism. And I, when I mean study, I've, I've read books about the religions. There's a like, small you know, part of me that wants to be a Taoist so bad. <laughs> like uh, well, there's a small part of me wants it so bad. Well, the Taoism, Buddhism. Because I think there, that's there's, it. There's two types: there's supernaturalism and panentheism. And again, if anybody wants to cor correct me, I'm fine with it. It's okay. I'm not acting like I know. I'm, yeah. I'm paraphrasing this. So not taking whatever you want to add, go ahead and add. Yeah. So panentheism believes that God exists inside the realm of actuality. And supernaturalism believes that God exists outside, like Islam, Judaism, Christianity. But Buddhism, Taoism, they believe that it's inside yeah. the realm. Mm -hmm. That you could obtain to a godlike status and, you know, we are all God. Mm-hmm. I tend to take a supernaturalist view on it. I, I, I believe that if you ripped a, na a God into a billion pieces, like a napkin into a billion pieces, we're all a piece of that one napkin. I, there's yeah. still that napkin. Yeah, I hear you. you. Know? Like I, it says in the, in the good book, man, I am. Period. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it's like, oh, God, would you please, like, you know, interact and help influence this tiny-ass little situation that I got going in my everyday life. That's not the way... That shit works. But he is kind of like a molding influence or force on what's going on. He likes to make things that do things and make things. So I think there well, is like a, some sort of beautiful, chaotic order to what's going on. That absolutely. He's, you know? See, to, to me too as well, um, when, you, when you think of that, con I always use a school analogy where like when you're praying, you're not praying for God. I mean, you do pray in emergency situations, dear God, let me get through this. But if it's your will, let it be your will, you know? But give when me the I strength. Pray, like before games, when I used to play ball, I would pray that I could uh, use my talents to the best of my ability and make sure we come out no injuries, you know? Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, even before a show or whatever it may be, you know, you're not saying, God, do this for me. It's, it's saying, let me tap into these gifts that you've given me and the will of a human to go in and, and, and do it, you know? Yeah. And again, man, I think people miss, miss the whole purpose of it. They think the commandments are somebody telling you what to do. It's not. It's, it's a blueprint yeah. on how to get a good spiritual experience. Like, you're not going to go to hell just because of porn. you watch porn. What happens with porn is it, it's like fast food for your mind. It interferes with an intimate relationship. It makes you want stuff that you that you're missing in front of you, and and it's bad for you. Yeah. Now it doesn't mean you're going to hell, right? It, it's just bad for you. I mean, so like, it, hey, I had to, tips. Yeah. I had to cut mine out, dude. I was jerking off three times a day at one point in the hotel. Rooms. I'm actually, Brad. I'm I'm glad that you brought this up, man. This is something that I've been going back and forth with over the last couple of years. Is that I've been telling my buddies, like, listen. We're all going to do what we're going to do, okay? So I'm not going to judge you or say anything that you shouldn't do. But, like, I've been legit telling my male friends, 
you need to like back up on the porn a little bit if you want. When we have those conversations late at night, I'm like, dude, I've stopped over the last two weeks and I cannot tell you like how much you don't realize how much it kind of fucking it fucks with your thoughts a little bit, your expectations of what fucking a real relationship or intimacy is. Like, and everything needs to be, like, double D, skinny waist, fat ass, and they need to be swallowing. You need another girl yeah, on the balls. Shit, you need to be coming on their fucking face. You need to be... And it kind of just gives you this warped idea of what that shit's supposed to be in the first place. And, yeah, every once in a while, like, dude, I think... I could probably make an argument that it's not that horrible either, but I think there is wisdom to trying to stay away from certain things like that. Look, I, I, I would tell you this. I would agree with you. I mean, look, it's not bad. It's not like if, if you, but you can get addicted to that shit, man. And especially if you're trying to stay faithful, you know, like you're on the road. Like I would be on the road. And I wouldn't go talk to any girls, and then I would just go to my room and fucking put a porn on, jerk off, go to sleep. And then, then, then it's like, oh, I need to rub one out to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, dude, what are you talking about? I've never had that happen to me before. I've never had to jerk See, off to fall asleep. Again, that's what the whole concept of say something like Lent. Now, again, it, it's so you. Let me let me. Re- uh, preface this by saying one of my favorite quotes is Eleanor Roosevelt said, intelligent minds discuss issues, average minds discuss events, simple minds discuss people, right? Ah, dude, one of my favorites as well. Good call. So when you're looking at related, somebody goes to you, well, what do you think? If you eat meat on Friday, you're going to go to hell? And they <laughs> stare at you with that stupid look. Like, ah, oh, you got me. I'm, I'm, I don't, you don't understand the concept of denying yourself uh, a habit. How that helps you grow spiritually when when you cut porn out or you cut drinking out or you cut. You're supposed to get rid of something negative during Lent that is going to better as a person. And not eating meat is the same reason why is uh, Muslims pray five times a day. It, it putting it's letting yourself something before God just to, just to make you think about it, make yeah. you, make you think about Him and, and your experiences and being thankful and you know it's it's a sim, it's symbolism. Now, that's the problem with the Catholic Church. It's just full with it. But, you know, a lot of it is based in tradition. I mean, as an Italian-American, you know, it's just part of our culture. It's what I'm comfortable with. But I can say hello to you in English. I can say hello to you in Spanish. I can say hello to you in Italian. But they all mean hello. It's just different ways to communicate that you're comfortable with. Yes. No, that makes you sense, know? dude. I like that. I'm comfortable with Catholicism. Now, truth be told, if you put all the religions out on the table— and I had to choose one with no influence and no familiarity. I don't think I'm going Catholic. <laughs> There's a lot of rules. Yeah, um, what's this guy with the robe and the pointy hat? What the fuck yeah, is man, happening? What's going on here? <laughs> what's the, what is it? What are we doing here? <laughs> All right, that's cool, dude. I, I like that, man. Like, And listen, these are conversations that I think, I don't know, like... I think we're very capable of having them. And I think that people enjoy listening to them. I think... Some are a little, they think it's a little daunting to even bring something like this up, but I think it's a good well, thing. We, whenever you're talking with people that can remove emotion, and like I said, I'm okay with being wrong. I mean, you could question me all you want. I remember uh, I did a joke on Comedy Central years ago because, you know, when people, were, it was so popular to get off on um, religion. And I was like, you know, atheists have murdered millions of people in the 20th century. I mean, now, I'm not saying atheism did it, but the same reason why you can't use, uh, uh, you can't put St. Jude's Hospital in the same category as West Baptist Church. Yeah. You know what I mean? I read you. There's context. There's different, yeah. But when you think about the things that Stalin did and Hitler did, and by the way, Stalin was way worse than Hitler. Pol Pot. Um, you know, you're looking at not even in when you talk about what happened in what, China. Yeah, I was going to say Chinese homie. What was his name? Fucking Yao or whatever. Yao, that guy Yao, not, more than anybody. Yeah, Mao's Leap Forward. What was that? Mao's Leap Forward, wasn't it? God, fucking. When when all those people starved. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, I, I know. So I know. Him. Stalin starved the Ukraine. I mean, look. Again, it's human beings. It's human nature. I mean, it's the, the problem is you're going to. You're going to, one person can cause a fucking ripple effect when people don't think as individuals. I mean, you see it now. 
Dude. You see people that are just red or blue, and you're not looking at the issues. You're not looking. You're you're reach. You're talking about everything but what we need to do. It would be like it's fourth and one. Do we punt or do we go for it? And everybody's talking about everything from what the coach is wearing <laughs> to we need to put in an Asian quarterback to that. Uh, you know, why aren't I in? It, it just we got to quit. Dude, What's this the, is like Henry is, Thoreau. This is remind, uh, reminds me of Henry. Uh, I think it was Henry Thoreau. I think the the quote is many a thousand are hacking at the branches of evil with very few striking the root. Something like uh-huh. that. It's like everybody fucking like yeah, we're everybody's trying chipping to like, away, but, but you're not the problem. you're not fucking getting to the root of the problem. Yeah, I uh-huh. love yeah. So I think that quote. Well, I, I do feel that we need a think tank in America, which would be a third party, would be great. And uh, you know, where you could just get object people that are just talking issues. That's why I liked Andrew Yang. You know, whenever you heard the guy speak, he was never talking about the candidates. It was so much about why we might need this universal basic income. You know, now whether you agree with the UBI or not is irrelevant. It's the way he presented the argument and the way he was campaigning. Mm-hmm. To me, was was very refreshing. It was like, okay, this guy's just discussing issues. Yeah, I don't think that he even imagined that he was going to get that far in his campaign. But I think that he did have a listen. A lot of people, especially on the right side, like my Republican friends, they're like, of course everybody likes him. They want free money. All these fucking freeloading liberal hippies, they just want free money in their bank account every week. That's one way to look at it. But also, nobody would have thought that we'd be fucking dealing with a global pandemic in 2020 because we tend to forget about shit and we need to be reminded every once in a while. This generation hasn't had a NAM or World War II or whatever we haven't really had a major problem in almost – I mean, even no. Vietnam was, was a conflict. Mm-hmm. You know, we haven't had a world war in almost 70 years around there, maybe longer than that. Where And we haven't had a, a plague in, uh, since 1912, really. Yeah. We're just a spoiled bunch of fucking people that are running around and everybody's – it does. It makes me sick, man. It, 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 it bothers me how unappreciative people are of life and the system and other people – and, you know, but it's ignorant people that behave this way. But uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, man. Yeah, you're right. We haven't had a pandemic or anything since. Dude, this don't generation. say sorry, bro. We're just shooting the shit, man. I was actually trying to, as you were talking, pull up. Um, I had a whole list of like, because I could tell you're a quote guy and I love quotes, too. And there was one that was trying to find Mary Wollstonecraft. No man chooses evil because it's evil. He only mistakes it for happiness. The good he sees. Dude, I. I have a great I have a great analogy with that that I say all the time is that when evil's going to confront you, it's never going to show you its face. So it because you'd run from it, right? I like that. And it uses it uses um, altru- it uses the police department, teachers. It, it, it infiltrates good good things and it tries to distort it from within. Yeah. So whenever when so if if I'm going to sit there and say you know. All teachers, we should get rid of the public school system because that's where most pedophiles are school teachers, male and female across the board, overwhelmingly. It's not even close. Okay. True. We're not going to get rid of the public school system. Yeah. Right? True. Because people infiltrate. Mm-hmm. Evil infiltrates. The yeah. bad cop is not the police force. Because it needs a place to operate. You can get the naive people or you can get the, the weak and you, people that you can prey on. You need that. You could go the other way with that, too, you know, where uh, good corrupts evil as well. So, you know, I know some really, really good drug dealers that are good people. And I know some good people that are, you know, you wouldn't think are good people, by the way, but they're good. They're good men. Yes. Yes. That are on the other side. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I I actually, without getting details, there's a few people that I know that on paper you would look at and go, this guy's a, a... shouldn't be in society but in reality they're good people yeah yeah no most definitely man i know a lot of people that's like be honest with you i've had family members who have you know had their faith tested and and whatnot and we've gone through some things and at the end of the day it's like how do you you can't judge hearts man and nature versus nurture who's to say some person who was born in any given situation where it's like 
dude, I mean, we really do have it easy here, man. This is Absolutely. the best time to live. It's the best place to live on this planet. Absolutely. And sometimes people aren't, you know, we can sit around and be like, oh, my God, why I didn't get this and I didn't get that. But you become somehow, a, you know, somewhat well-managed uh, human being. But at the end of the day, you sit around and judge people because they don't act in accordance with your standards. And I, we have to have some sort of standard standard for human behavior. But going around, that's something that I didn't really love about the organized religion, to be honest with you. Because I grew up Jehovah's Witness. And oh, wow. Yeah. Both my parents uh, devout. My dad was high up in the, in the organization. And... Very good people. A lot of people do have some misconceptions about them. Most of them very good people, but some of them use it as a tool to judge other people and look down at them and feel superior about themselves and think that their thoughts are in line with God's thoughts and shit. And that can be a very dicey road to go down where you start thinking that your thoughts are in line with God's and everybody else's. And we all have experienced those people, but we all, you also have the same. And again, uh, with the progressive atheist that thinks that they are so intellectually superior and they are as judgmental as they come. Think about politics. I know, it's, it's the same thing. It's like, but that's what I mean. It's the same person. Yeah. You know, religious, religious extremists and conspiracy theorists, there, there's a mental disorder called apophenia. And it's the ability to connect dots that don't exist. Uh -huh. Right. And, I like that. I got to write that down. Hold right, on. it's called apophenia. And uh, actually, if you're if you're a comic book nerd, uh, the question uh, in Justice League, who was actually he looks like Rorschach, he has a thing on his face, suffers from that. But it's what makes him a great detective is that he can, he connects dots that are just out of, all out, all over the place. Mm -hmm. But you find this in these two groups of people. It just depends on what they're exposed to. And once you're exposed to something first, the next thing that kicks in is confirmation bias. So confirmation bias, obviously, you know what that is, where people are just reading whatever they agree with. Let me go to my far-leaning left or right yeah. website so I can be told like, that I'm right. Dude, I just read this article on americasucks.com. You know, <laughs> and, and, Flat and, Earth and Society, bro. And, and it's, 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 it's amazing how people don't even understand how the, the problem-solving process works. So let's say, for instance, I take a video of – Nancy Pelosi speaking on Fox News. And I use that to show somebody that she said that. Now, what? these are the three things that happen. One, it's Fox News, so it, it's, it's Fox. Out the right. window. Mm. Well, they'll be like, hey, it's Fox. It can't count, mm. right? Because they're, they're one-sided, even though it's the person talking. So if I, show this, if I show the Kennedy assassination on Fox, it never happened, right? Then the next mm. thing that comes in is uh, the ego, right? So the ego in itself, now there is something where you're, any editorial needs to be discounted, right? That's why I like to go to PolitiFact or uh, Fact Check. Those are usually your, your two better, but even Snopes is biased. It's one guy. Yeah, yeah. PolitiFact is probably the best you can do, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah, I probably agree with that. Then you got to remove your ego from it and your emotions. So that's what people don't understand science. You're not, when you're thinking scientifically, you're not, emotionally attached to the outcome. It's just whatever it is, it is. See, their worth it's, is attached to that. They attach yes. their worth to that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they're not, they're not intellectuals. Now it doesn't mean they're not smart because you could be an intellectual and not be that knowledgeable. <clears throat> you could just, <clears throat> all intellectualism is this idea, hearing this idea, weighing it out, applying what you know, looking at patterns you know Being I mean? your own devil's advocate in your head, kind of. Absolutely, you know. you're questioning, and <clears throat> that's why comics have the best conversations because we're contrarians by nature, man. I've never met a comedian that just heard information it's like, "Oh yeah, I agree with that 100." <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> you're poking holes in it as soon as you hear it. Yeah. So being an intellectual is a process; it takes practice, and it, it took practice for me. Now, again, intellectualism doesn't mean you're intelligent. Yeah, doesn't mean you're smarter than the other person. Yeah, it's just a, it's the way of processing information and presenting information. No, what's I, one of my favorite quotes is knowledge is ubiquitous nowadays. People don't give a shit about what you know. It's about what care. you do with what you know. That is what matters, and people get that twisted a lot.
You know what? You know what my biggest thing is that I do, and this is my thing, so you can take it. And again, if somebody has a hole in it, if I'm talking to somebody and they say I feel, like I feel like, or if they say I think, here's what I think. You can usually determine that, or use that when they're expressing emotion over thinking. But if you're using I feel a lot, I don't even mean sometimes, all the time. Well, here's what I feel. Okay. What's that got to do with what you think? Oh, and that feeds so into the identity politics of everything oh, that's going absolutely. on right now. Oh, they just eat that shit up, dude. They dude, love it's crazy, it. man. I mean, you, you, I remember in the early 2000s when, when the Iraq war was going on and you criticized the Iraq war and all of a sudden you were not a patriot, right? Now, but the other thing is I'm a comedian, so... It's, it's hilarious when something happens and now I go on Facebook and all my friends are expert economists, expert health officials. Shut the fuck. <laughs> I know. Shut up, dude. How you can they not have this? Like, bitch, do you have any idea what it's like to run a global economy? It's just so <laughs> fucking complicated. And they're like, dude. why can't we just have more shoes for the pigmates? And it's like, I feel you on that. <laughs> like, I feel you on that. We should. I just want to save all the cats. All the cats and dogs out there that are not, I feel you, but you got to be fucking realistic. No, the best is when I got my, my 40 something year old friend telling me how they should run the economy. Meanwhile, he has a roommate and fucking uh, has no 401k. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, dude. I, Here's what we need to do. Yeah. Uh, really? <laughs> it's a Wednesday night and it's five in the morning and we're drunk. <laughs> yeah. And we, you just did rails of cocaine in the yeah. fucking green room. Dude, I just need to get in that fucking Oval Office, bro. I'm telling you. It's like, okay, Dude, bud. I, I just think, uh, I think that America has some of the greatest minds and the world has some of the greatest minds and they're not in Congress. Oh, dude. Well, and, that's the problem. And they're definitely not in the White House. And what we need to do is just start getting a third party together of intellectuals, of people, of, just have opposing views. I mean, some of the best debates were, um, Hitchens and uh, the guy from MIT, the math teacher. The math oh, professor. shit. Um, Come on, he was from Ireland. He, Anyways, fuck. those two were best friends, and they were polar opposites. You know? Yeah. God, now I'm trying to fucking think of his name. I'm all fucked up. Uh, I'll pull it up later. Yeah. I feel you on that. It's, it's very interesting to see how um, people get wrapped up in things and try and Again, many are striking the branches of evil with you hitting the root. I just, I fucking love that quote too. I knew, but you I did do that. understand. I do understand the thought process because I do it in sports, right? So I do understand that the the way that they have their party affiliation and they're just so gung ho. You know, like when, when you're hearing somebody talking about the charisma of the candidate and what what you need to do is pair this person with a woman, and then that will get the polls out, and then this. You're, nobody's discussing what, what they need to do. In sports, you get that fanaticism, but it's something that you could put that fanaticism in that means nothing. In politics, it means something. Like, if you're willing to overlook criminal behavior, if you're willing to overlook people that have been in Congress almost 40 years and have a net worth 15 times more than their salary should be, that's, if, 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 if there was a cop that, that made 50000 a year but he was worth $5 million. You know that motherfucker's doing something. Mm -hmm. Why don't we hold these people accountable? You're making 250000 a year, but you're worth $20 million? How the fuck is that possible? Dude, I, we have to have term limits on these fuckers. We Absolutely. Got, we have to have total and complete finance um, campaign reform. Absolutely. It, there's... There's a lot that needs to happen, man. And also, like, I was thinking, the other, like, we live in a litigious society, bro. Like, that's why a lot of this shit is happening, that people don't want to get sued. So everything's getting Absolutely, shut down. Absolutely, dude. That's what it is. So I think that if you had it, if you could make a change to where if you make a wrongful lawsuit that you have to pay the fucking, you have to pay all the court costs. You have to pay every fucking thing out of your dude. dime. So wrongful lawsuits get, the, like, less of that. There's a lot that needs to happen that I think that can make positives. But again, you have dinosaurs and people who like to have things that way so they can maintain control. We got to get these fucking baby boomers out of office right away. I have never in my lifetime seen a group of people hold on to power longer than this group right now. 
What's that I mean, fucking ninety something year old fuck out of like Missouri or something? I got from oldest congressman. It's insane, man. It's insane. Orrin Hatch. That's the guy Orrin he's Hatch. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's what I was thinking of. That's just- Fucking 84 years old, man. He's been in office 41 fucking years, man. Oh, God. Man. This guy, his fucking face. It says that he's 86 right now. Hold on. He looks kind of like he would be related to uh, Dr. Drew or something. Not just because of the white hair, but like, he's got that kind of like face. Anyway. Yeah, these fucks need to go, bro. Um, he's been in office 41 fucking years. <laughs> See, dude. They were all the founding fathers were sitting around in their buckled shoes. They knew exactly how this was going to fucking happen. And Thomas Jefferson was saying, listen, every nine years, we need to look at this Constitution thing. We need to have term limits for these fucking people. We need. And, you know, everybody wants to sit around and they're a purist, a constitutionalist and fucking. I don't know. This well, be- listen, you can amend the Bill of Rights is the only thing you, you shouldn't touch. That's it. Everything else you amend. Yeah. That's what they the, fucking... The, the basic concept of... You know, there's so many misconceptions about the... God isn't in the Constitution. And neither is... Uh, neither is um, Separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. That's not, that's not there either. That was in a letter from Thomas Jefferson. In fact, the government was created to protect... Religion was to be protected by the government. Not the other way around. Not protect government from religion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. The, the whole concept of the government and people are one. So what does that mean? The government is Christian, it's atheist, it's Muslim, it's it's Hindu. Whatever the people are, the government are. And the other problem is it should be the other way around. And what I have noticed is that progressives have pulled the government from the people away. And what the, the right-wingers do, and even a lot of Democrats as well, they're both, they both do that, right? But I'm, I'm saying this is mostly progressives. Mm-hmm. View the government as an entity and not a system, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a system. Mm. That's all it is. Yeah. So the people and the government need to be brought back together. And on the flip side, what the corporations have done, they have become one with the government. So what we need to do, bring the people government back together and take the corporations out of the government. So right now it's the other way around. The government and the corporations are like this and the people and the government are fucking Away from me. And they like that conflict too, man. They love that. Con- all sorts of wonderful little profitable things can happen as a result of that. They love it. Well, they, they bank on groupthink. They yeah. bank on it. Like, the you can't chamber. even talk bad about the president or defend him. And it's mostly defend him. I'll be honest with you. I don't think he's done. I, 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 I blame the World Health Organization and China for this whole thing. That's, that's who you got to point the finger at. I mean, when they were closing flights, from Wuhan to go anywhere in China, and then, but they were letting people in Wuhan come in and out of the country and go to other countries, and then lying about everything, because you had all the governors saying the same thing that the president was saying at one point, because that's the information they were getting. But it is what it is. We need to get together. This stimulus package, the way that it went down last time was disgusting. The next one that's on the fucking plate, these son of a bitches in Congress need to get rid of their goddamn personal agendas and their fucking special interests and just focus on the amount of money that they're going to give to the people and the small businesses. That's it. So, yeah, That's it. I, I agree. I don't have uh, the faith in that actually happening. That's kind of it's where I've, I've gotten to where I get to a little down on just like, dude, I mean, I want to. This is all we've got. And again, it's the best thing going. So we got to operate within it. But man, I do kind of throw my hands up sometimes and I'm just like, I've been watching this for a long time. Uh, I got a little peek behind the curtain to see how the sausage was made when I was in news and covering politics and seeing how information is dispersed throughout this country. And it's, it's disconcerting to say the very least. Shit's corrupt. And what I try and explain to my Democratic fr- uh, friends is like, you know that you got what you deserve, right? Like, you know that you got what you deserve because not only politics, but, dude, media is legit corrupt. And there is a real bias. And, I mean, with human beings, you're going to have that, right? But at the end of the day, what she did, not to get back into all this shit, but what Hillary did to push Bernie out of the DNC, her and Debbie Wasserman Schultz, And they did it again this fucking time. They did it with Tulsi. 
you're getting what you deserve because at the end of the day, you're not letting democracy take place. This is like everybody wants to get on the Republicans for electoral college, but what about the superdelegates with the Democrats? The, dude, I mean, I, exactly. And not only that, the del- we need the electoral college. You need it. It's a checks and balances. Yeah. You need it. Anybody who thinks it is that, ne- you know what bothers me the worst is the majority rule. Okay. Mm. Everybody says majority rules. No, it doesn't. It's called the majority rule. Not majority rules. So look up what the majority rule is. The principle that the greater numbers should exercise greater power. All right. Majority rule is a decision rule that selects alternatives which have a majority that is more than half the votes. It is the binary decision rule used most often in influential decision making bodies, including all the uh, legislature of democratic nations. So it's not the majority rules, it's the majority rule. Mm-hmm. So when when Thomas Jefferson wrote about the Electoral College and why the checks and balances are important, is he basically used the analogy that if there's three wolves and a sheep, and they're trying to decide on what they want for lunch, how did the sheep make sure he doesn't become the lunch? <laughs> so that's the purpose of the Electoral College. Dude, I really like that analogy. I've never heard that one. I like that. It's Jefferson's, and, and I paraphrase it. So no, I get it. Jefferson, so, anyways, he was that's a cool the point. Cat. So you need you need to make sure because if if not, if it's just the majority, it's it's an easier thing to manipulate. Yeah, and you need voter IDs. You need um. You got to get rid of gerrymandering. You you need uh, uh the ability for other states to have a voice. Because if you're going to focus on population, you're just going to appease. Look at California. California is the biggest agricultural state in the union. Their GDP is like fucking, what is it, like fourth in the world or something like that? Yes. Yeah, and nobody nobody caters to the farmers. You're catering to L.A. and San Francisco. Yeah. No, yeah. No, dude, it's true, man. And listen, those are good people there. And if I hear one more person say democratic socialism, I'm going to fuck. There's no such thing. It is so ignorant. And, and, and the bailout isn't socialism. The money comes from a capitalistic system, and the ta- it's the taxpayer dollars just being allocated back to the taxpayers. That's not socialism. I mean, and it's insane different- to me how these publicly traded – well, it's not insane. You could figure it out. How these publicly traded corporations got their money first, Right? How these big major corporations and the small businesses are still getting processed. You knew that was going to happen. Yes. Yes. Dude, sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry to fucking do this. But you know that ant that was crawling in my, in my computer? You screen? killed it? And it is stuck. I shouldn't have fucking pushed it because now I've got an ant that is dead in the middle of my computer screen that now I see a you dead. You have OCD? It's going to drive you nuts. So I'm going to have to buy a new fucking screen now pretty much. Awesome. That you have OCD? I don't have like a little bit, a little bit. I, like, that I don't, would drive me crazy if I couldn't get that in out. Like, but when I was, the problem is that's why I did it. But now I fucked myself over because now I'm looking at a fucking dead ant in the middle of my screen. Damn it! That's like when the teacher. Remember when the teacher would erase the chalkboard and leave that little piece of chalk, and I would just stare at the one that they didn't get. <laughs> Oh, dude, I'm trying to get it with my mouse and shit. I'm losing my fucking mind. No, I can't look at it anymore. Anyway, yeah, let it go, man. Let it go. I'm going to let it go. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I do have a little a little bit of OCD. Really quick before we um get into that, like what are you what are you listening to right now, dog? What's in your fucking iTunes, iPod, iPhone? What's going on? What are you? Because I know you like the old stuff too. Like I grew up on rock and Motown, classic rock, Motown. That's the shit that I listen to. But that kind of influenced everything else. I think as long as it's good music, I I like it. But that's very you know subjective. So what what are you listening to, bro? Well, it depends. Like I was just working out and jumping ropes. I was. I, I like DMX. Um, 
I think he's All a right. as a rapper. Uh, when I drive in around, I like to listen to like Andy Gibb, the Bee Gees. I love uh, that like easy listening station music. Neil Diamond, Barry Manilow. Fuck yeah! Know. Oh, do you uh, have a uh, Sirius XM? Yes, I do. You like Yacht Rock? I love Yacht Rock. It's the best. Yacht Rock is the shit. Yeah. I didn't know about that until recently because I don't have Sirius, but my cousin had that shit, and I was like, "Dude, these are fucking jams, bro!" Like they're all like I'm not a fan of obscure ones too that are yeah. Great. I love like uh, you know, uh, who's the one we listen to? Not Paul Hogan. What's his name? I go crazy when I look in your eyes. Oh, I go- oh, oh! You're fucking killing me now. I'm gonna- Way deep down inside, Paul Davis. Oh, there you go, Paul Davis. Paul Davis. Oh, yeah. Like you know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Perfect. But I love too, man. Like '80s freestyle music, expose, Trinier, um, all that Guido, I rock driving music. But I don't. I'm not a fan of '80s rock, man. I think it's awful. I like. So you're 70s not like rock. White Snake, fucking. No, nah, I don't that hairband shit. Like the 70s fucking rock was this shit, dude. I feel like I would have thrived in like the late 60s, 70s with Led Zeppelin, fucking like America, Cream, all those yeah. fucking bands, Jimmy, Clapton, like uh, that. That would be, that's my spot right there. I feel like I would thrive. I love classic rock. Dude. I, you I fuck with Disco. Motown? You fuck with Motown at yeah, all? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, we grew up with a lot of that stuff in my household, you know, uh, just my mom cleans to it. It was her music growing up. And then like, I grew up on a lot of Sinatra and stuff because, well, Jimmy Roselli is actually there you my, go. my grandfather's my favorite, my, his favorite. Um, and cause my grandfather grew up in Hoboken and they were both from Hoboken from Sinatra and Jimmy Roselli. But, um, but you know, it, it's not my era, but I grew up on it because it's always played in the house. Fuck yeah. Dude. And, and doo-wop is also there. That's my mother. I was see look, and Artie Lang brought this point up, and I think it's a brilliant point, especially with kids of Italian American descent. Like our parents were cool, our grandparents were cool, our uncles were cool. All the older people in our family we liked to hang out with. We yeah. didn't move out. So we liked Frankie Valley. I wasn't into like the Doors and that type of shit. Because we, you know what I mean. Not that it hit me uh, anti-establishment. I mean, I like the Doors, but I get that. I get that. It, it was, and the only reason why is because my mother wasn't into it. So there are things I listened to later on in life that I, I picked up on. Like, we were Elvis, not the Beatles. You know, we're Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons you're going to hear at this house all the time. Of course. Uh, of course. Connie Francis. Dude. Oh, hell yeah. Okay, I got So, I don't remember whether I said this to you or not. Um, was your mom all about communication? And I don't know, some, some Ita- Italian or Irish moms are like this where they want to talk about everything. Everything yeah. wants to be taught until there's something they don't want to talk about. Was your mom at yeah, all no, like I'm, that? I'm, no, I'm very fortunate. I mean, my mom's a real khaki arm. She talks about everything. Everything. Uh, not cool. stop. Everything. I mean, she'll be on the phone loud, laughing. She's got a bubbly personality. She's there, so there's nothing she's afraid to talk about. Like not that. Uh, we mom. just never talked to her about it. It was more me, and, and and she was closer with my older brother with that type of stuff. But you know, we were very very open woman. I mean, you know, because my, my, my brother would talk to her when he was gay. Like he he wasn't afraid to come out to her. He was afraid to come out to me. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, eventually, obviously, he did. But it, she's just not into just no anything's free game. All right, that's cool, dude. I like to hear that because yeah. it's not a, a not a slight at all on moms, yours or mine. Because my mom grew up Irish Catholic, and then she met my father. They became Jehovah's Witness. Very religious mind. Very very good, like kind of pure human being. She, there's really not a bad bone in her body, but there's just certain things that she doesn't feel comfortable talking about. That's all. Yeah, yeah she. She, I, I mean, I could get that, I, but it was more me and my, like, I never talked to my mother. I didn't get the birds and the bees from her or none of that shit. We just never discussed it. Mm, okay. If anything, I'd talk to my godfather, uh, more to him, but more about business stuff and life stuff, you know, later on in life. But when I was younger, I just learned from my idiot friends. Okay. But I would never bring it up to her, ever. 
no mm. fucking way. Man. No way. All right. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's different. My mother had three boys. She raised us on her own, you know? Yeah, so, and also it's a respect thing. Like, you're it's not a protective trying, thing. Yeah. We were yeah, very protective that. of her because, you know, it was just the way it is. Oh, I get that. You know? All right, dude, this is uh, something we weren't able to really talk about much yesterday. But I wanted to talk, like, just go over some of the shit that you've done in your career. Obviously, like, there's a lot to get to. But when and where did you first try stand up? Uh, Miami. Miami was the Miami. spot. Well, yeah? I, I technically I did it in New York, but it was only once, and it was like it didn't really count. So Miami is when I came down here. It's Miami. I did it at the uh, Comedy Zone that used to be in South Beach. You remember your first joke? Yeah, of course. What was it? Um, it was the Bill Clinton joke about the dress. Oh, I'm trying. You got to ref- you got to refresh my memory. Well, Monica Lewinsky, when they found the dress with the cum on the dress, uh-huh. uh, and I, I was like, I feel bad for the guy because that could happen to anybody. I mean, God forbid they found the sock under my bed. <laughs> there you hacky, go. Uh, you got some laughs. Yeah, but it's hacky. You know, every every male hack is masturbation. You know, this is true. That's, we always got a masturbation joke. All right, so I started seeing you around, I think it may, might have been a little before, but I remember Premium Blend 2005. That was like right around where you were roller skating big, right? No, Premium Blend was Premium Blend was the Blackie Johnson bit about the first. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then the roller skating bit came out in 08. Okay, that makes and then my half so much hour more came sense. Out, I shot it in '09, but it came out in 2010. Copy of that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that actually makes a lot more sense. But you did so at first. You did that uh, MTV Wrestling Society X show, right? So that was actually that was like in 06, 07 ish, right? I respect. Yeah. I gotta say, man, I respect the wrestlers for their work ethic, like toughness. The creativity, all that shit. I just never got hooked to wrestling as a kid. I have a lot of friends who fucking love it. Like, still obsessed to it. They're in their fucking mid-30s. They still like that shit. But I imagine, obviously, you're a wrestling fan since you did that show. How did that show come to fruition? Uh, how did that happen? Um, MTV do do something with me. And it was right when they started um, getting away from the videos more, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and it was a lot of crappy shit that they were doing. Like a lot of that reality, hacky, like, you know. My teen life shit. or whatever. It was awful. And then my my agent called me and said, hey, listen, man, uh, I don't know if you want to do this or not, but MTV wants to meet with you. They're doing a professional wrestling show. And I'm, I'm like, dude, I'm a huge mark, man. You know, my, my grandfather was involved with the uh, Dennis James up, at the, up in New York back in the day. Um, I've just been watching it my whole life, you know. So I go in and there was uh, XPW, I think it was XPW, the kid Chris Kleinrock and Houston. And then um, they were like really into wrestling. MTV was trying to bring a comic in. They were against it, but they, they had to appease the network, right? Mm. But they knew I was a real wrestling fan, so it helped. That's cool. And then, and then uh, I wanted to do it like that. I meant, you know. It was so much to me. It's it was a kid's dream. It's just that's one of the reasons why I got into this stuff is to do stuff I always thought I, I wanted to do as a kid and to host professional wrestling was to me it was just great, man. But, but you know, it only lasted one season. Dude, I will say like I, that makes a lot of sense though. Then that scene, and you should never ever fucking look back at that with anything but like happiness because. Like you said, you got to do something that was a dream of yours as a kid. Like, Dude, are you kidding me, man? That's the way you treat. You, look, the the blueprint for success is the same blueprint for bombs in Hollywood. Fail better, fail better, fail better, fail better. I mean, I'm just saying, like, there's people that take projects that they shouldn't have taken, turned out. You don't know, so you just do what, what you want to have fun with. Yeah, man. And I will say, you're 100 percent right about the wrestlers, man. They're, they listening to wrestlers talk is the same as country western singers and comics. It's the same conversation where a few art forms left where you actually have a circuit, right? Mm, like yeah. there was those chicken wire places in the South and you mm-hmm. can go to Nashville and see these kids playing in bars. And then with professional wrestling, there's a uh, amateur circuit comedy. There's a circuit. You don't really hear that with, um, you know, pop music. There's no coffee shop circuit. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
I mean, these are people that pay their dues and you listen to wrestlers talk. And it's the same conversation. I, there are guys that be like, yeah, there's a, a meet up in Modesto. They only pay $50. You want to go? And they'll be like, yeah, but you have to drive because my car doesn't work. You know, it's like the same conversation. Yeah, that's fucking great. Dude, that's so true, man. Yeah, they really are like that. And like, I, I dude, I really got to give it to them, their work ethic, man. Like these poor oh, fucking sick. people and they have to, they're technically subcontractors. Uh, like so they don't get insurance or all this shit like mcmahon i don't really know all the ins and outs of it and i'm sure some of this might sound like fucking you know blasphemy to some people but it doesn't sound to me like he takes very good people uh, care of the wrestlers like he's pretty much he puts I mean, it on them like he gives them the platform and give them like you know decides the ones that he really likes that he wants to succeed but uh, Dude, first off, to get to that point where you're in his, like, good side is hard enough, but everybody is treated, to me, it seems, like, pretty shitty. The schedule that they have to stick by, I mean... But nobody's putting a gun to... Listen, it's the same thing with comedy, it's the same thing with anything. Now, would I run my business differently? Absolutely. But at the same time, what is he... A lot of these guys have self-destructive behavior. As, as do a lot of comedians. So he's giving them a healthy platform almost to go and... If you guys want to beat the fuck out of each other, you're making X amount of dollars, which you probably wouldn't be doing bouncing at the club or whatever else you're doing. It's not my responsibility to teach you how to invest your money and do that. Now, it's not his responsibility, but could he have a program for them maybe? I don't know. I, mean, yeah. I know he was pushing the steroids at one point, they said, and, you know, you don't have to do it. Yeah. No. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they're they're big yes, boys and big girls. He, he absolutely, I think, there are people that take advantage of people that let... Hey, I'm one of those people, though, who just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I But there that. are people that are that don't have time for that. And, and, you know, I'm sure he's not the nicest guy in the world, but no uberly successful person is. This is true. I don't know. No, I hear you. But I do know a lot of the, like, I became very good friends with Piper. And, you know, and Roddy uh, would tell me stories. And, you know, a lot of those wrestling guys, they're just, they're not the type of, they don't think big picture, some of them, you know? Mm, yeah. They're kind of. I mean, obviously, look at the mortality rate. I mean, the suicides, the drug addiction. I mean, it's pretty rampant. And again, I don't want to general, generalize, generalize the industry. But there's enough to where you could see that there's a pattern. Yeah, for sure. No, you just got to, yeah. That's kind of where, as an outsider looking at it, I'm just kind of like, man, like you said, I, I would like to think that if I was running a little differently, like try and take care of some of these guys. Like I've watched the story of Diamond Dallas Page and what he does with all these like ex wrestlers and the. DDP yoga and all that shit. I just, that shit, when I watch that, I'm like, fuck yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I really appreciate that there are guys out there that exist, but it's like, it's fucked up and sad, I think. Just like, you know, you'd like to think that they take better care of them, but at the same time, like, unless they're forced to, and you said nobody's holding the gun up to their heads, and it is like, it's, it's complicated, I can imagine, to have that sort of. So there's setup been athlete, there's been athletes in the past in wrestling that have walked away from it because they're like, look, I don't want to limp my whole life. And then there's people in and sports that have retired early because they don't want to they don't want to get hurt. And again, man, I I I don't want to play. I don't want to split hairs here, but I, I do think that you know. I would have run it differently, absolutely. I, I would try and, and reach out to these kids or people and have programs for them. I would do that. But then again, you know, I don't own the WWE. All right. 2006, 2007, where, like, then you'd start doing some stuff with Showtime, like Comic Without Borders. You were on the weeds. What was that yeah. like? I just recurred. I was yeah. in two episodes. End of season two, beginning of season three. It was great, man. I love it. I loved it. It it's so cool when you get on a set, man. And it's so funny because, like, again, it's it's the same how people were taking for granted the corona, you know, before the coronavirus that they got to go to work. Um, I've always been a person to try and stay in the moment. And, you know, you get on set sometimes, you hear people complaining that they have to stay an extra hour. 
you know, whatever it may be. And I'm like, fuck that, man. I want to stay here every second because I know how hard it takes to even get a role. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I enjoyed it, man. I took it in. It was great, man. Because I, I, every gig I do, I act like I may never do one again. Yeah. No, yeah. I read you. That That's good. I think that that's probably a um, healthy way to look at it to make sure that you get what you can out of it, you know, and you're not taking yeah. it for granted. You're trying to be present. Uh, the only thing I ever done, I was like, um, I've done a lot of voice and stuff like that. But as far as being on sets, like I was uh, extra on Transporter 2. Jason Statham was running around with his fucking like shirt off and shit for a couple of days. Raw on set. It was such a cool experience. This is how long it takes for them to set up shots and shit. Oh, God. It's, it's, it's brutal, man. It is. Um, but it's it was a hurry cool. up and wait. I have this ability to like get places where I'm not supposed to be. And my buddy Lewis was just like, this motherfucker. They're all like hanging out in the extra area. And I am hanging out with Statham, the guy with the red hair who was in that movie. I forget his name. He was in Snatch. I'm like, we got Liberia's deficit in your pocket. Or that, that was a lot of from Smoking Barrels. Anyway, I'm sitting back there hanging with him. And I'm talking to the second unit director. And my buddy, Lewis, is like way far in the back, supposed to be with his girlfriend walking down a path just as an extra and they did the shot statham comes running up to the camera looks intense and runs away they didn't even make it into the shot in the background so i told the director i'm like hey like my cousin or my um yeah he's my cousin half cousin lewis i'm like he, he's not even getting in the shot man you need to tell him to start a little later he sees me talking to him and he gets on his bullhorn he's like can you uh start a little later down the and my buddy's just looking at me like, bro, what the hell are you doing back there? Now you're directing like the second unit? What the fuck? I'm like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It was a really cool experience, though, just seeing how it's done. And um, again, that's the only time I've ever been on a real set like that. But it was pretty fucking sweet. My first gig in L.A. was I used to work on Young and the Restless. And I did background work there for like five days a week. And then I would get a couple of lines every now and then. Dude, and, uh, you did the soaps, bro? I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I was, uh, I was like, I could playing. see it now that you say, it. I could see it. Well, I was playing a waiter in, uh, in the uh, cafe where the kids would hang out. Like, so young or stuff. restless, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, I was fucking 30. <laughs> it sucked. I, I, my first under five was a waiter. Now, under five means under five lines. And then I had to leave working the day to go wait tables in real life. So I played a waiter and then went to go wait. Dude, that's uh, I know a lot of comedians who wait fucking Sebastian. A lot of people fucking wait tables. They're coming yeah. up, dude. I did it for years, man. Uh, I but I gotta say, for me, when it really solidified, at least I, so I noticed uh, you, Sebastian, a lot of these guys on Vince Vaughn's Wild West uh, the comedy tour. And I know that like it didn't do like great at the box office, right? But it fucking that was a great. I thought that that was a really cool idea, a good way to get that out there into the mind, uh, like hearts and minds of people and show them kind of like what it's like, not only for these comedians to go out, but Vince Vaughn, kind of like the ringleader, he was going out and just like uh, trying to bring some legitimacy, I guess, for the guys who were coming up like you and Sebastian and say, all right, come out and fucking check us out. And I was, and I don't mind saying this to you because I know that like it's been a long time. But I was I was bummed out that it didn't have like a better at least box office reception because I was like this is good shit man I wish that people would hop on us. Yeah, we got uh we re we got released during the writer strike and we couldn't promote it and Vince couldn't go on any of the talk shows or anything so it, that it was in makes theaters. a lot of sense. It was in theaters for two weeks and then we lost it then it was done and then it, it lived again on HBO and then it became kind of like a cult. Following. A cult thing, yeah, where yeah. people f that were are into comedy have loved it and were watching it, got their hands on it, and then uh, you know it was one of those things, man. It's been living on cable since two thousand eight. Dude, I think it's fucking hilarious, man. I love it. You do that, then you start doing some shit with Chelsea lately, or maybe before or after. I've heard a lot of different things about Chelsea. What's she like? What are your impressions um, of it? I will say Chelsea and Joe Rogan are the only two that have really done anything for comedians in the past 15 years, man. I mean, Leno didn't really blow him up. And it just, you know, there was, if you look at some of the bigger comics, they're either now off of Rogan's podcast or they were off of Chelsea Hamlin. 
Honorable mention to Conan. Yeah, Conan as well, of course. Honorable mention course. to Conan. Yeah, no, Conan, but you know, it, it was it wasn't it like he, he he would do stuff with Burr and other comedians as well, but Yeah, like Ron know, was, Funch is on. I think Ron Funch was uh Funches was on there the first time. He's had a No, couple. yeah, I would say Conan as well. But that's that's more it's been more like in the past five years, I think. I read you. It's been coming up. That's cool. I mean, they were trying to blow comics up, but it wasn't really working, and it just, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's, sometimes it fucking works, sometimes it doesn't. I, what's happening now in L.A., I, would, I think it's really, really cool what's happening at the comedy store and with the, with the comedy scene right now. It's really like a golden era, but... Before I get to that, what was it like hosting a game show, bro? That's something that I think that anybody who is being honest with themselves would be like, dude, why the fuck not? Why would I not want to host a game show? And the fact that you get to try it and do it, what was that experience like? Yeah, that was the Bad Girls Club. So basically, they took three of the bad girls from the Bad Girls Club and we tried to find love for them. Dude, okay, wow. This clicks. Like, Bad bad Girls Club is a huge thing, right? This is something That's that- why I did it. It was for Oxygen, and then they were trying to spin the game show off. But then they, the next season, they didn't go with me. They went with one of the old uh, cast members. I don't even know if it's still going. See, I that so over my head, dude. I've heard about it. Like, I know I've heard about Bad Girls Club and shit. But I just, I have no fucking clue. I've never seen it before. So that actually yes. makes sense, though, because I know that it's a huge thing. And you were in, like, Kesha's music video, right? Yeah, the blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, video. blah. Yeah, yeah, the director was a fan of comedy, and he asked me to do that character, that fucking Guido. But, yeah. hey, how you doing? God bless. <laughs> and then I did that in front of, yeah, just with her. She was mad cool, man. Very talented. She seems like she could be cool. I don't know why, like, um, I had kind of, like, uh misconceptions about her at first i'll just say that but i could see like i have seen stuff that's come out with her like she seems like she's like a good person you know it's it's funny too like that was almost when like that lady she was almost like with the lady gaga categorized you know at that time and, yeah and what lady gaga did i think was great and i heard her on stern one time playing the piano and you, i heard an interview with her and i'm like this girl is so fucking talented. She doesn't need to do all of that crazy outlandish shit. Like just focus on your talent, you know? And she, and I'm glad she got away from that crap, man. Yeah. Because, you know, when you listen to her, her, she is extremely talented, man, you know? And now you look at her as a respectable, instead of like a pop thing, you know? And I feel Kesha kind of fell in that category because of the way the marketing was, but she's a, she's a real musician, man. She writes her own shit. You know? That's cool. Drinks Jack Daniels. Ah, fuck yeah, dude. Oh, man, I can fuck with that. Dude, I like that. All right, so you, this is when, was American Comic your first special that you came out with? No, my half hour came out before American Comic, but I, I, what I did was, because at the time I didn't own any of that footage and stuff, I tried to take it all and put it on one CD. Hmm. Okay. Which now I'm thinking about taking the CD and just recording all that stuff so I can put it online. See, that's the problem. I can't share any of it. Mm. I had a top five special because that the, the half hour. Yeah, was dude, top it was five. top five in the fucking what was it? 2010. Yeah, the show, the showdown and uh, the Comedy Central. You know how they rate the out of the hundred, and I, I can't cut it up. I can't share it. I, you know, I, I think I think that their streaming site is now starting to catch up. But it was pretty antiquated, you know, and, and it was every time I go to share, share something, it would get flagged. I would be, you know, that kind of blows my mind that Comedy Central seems to be, you know, they've got it together in so many ways. But it's like, bro, you guys need to get this YouTube channel ironed out. You need to you have a, you're they're sitting on a lot of content that is yeah. not getting utilized. And if anything, like allow the people that you got the content from, like. You, yeah, you own the content, but be like, why don't we give this to Brett and see what he can do with it and see if he can, like, you know, cut it up or in a creative way fucking get it out there. You can still get their little percentage or whatever, maybe toss you fucking bone for being able to use your own shit and fucking putting it out there. I just, there, it seems like, like you said, antiquated, but it seems ri ridiculous to me that they're sitting on all this shit that they're not utilizing. I think they're, they're going to come around to it now. I mean, I just okay. think, you know, again, uh, they're seeing the power of it in the streaming services as well. So, Dude, I got to say the artwork 
for American comic when you were like flying through the brick wall with the mic, the Grey Goose, the American flag. I really like that one. Grey and Horn did that. Who? Grey Horn. He's a, a, one of the top Marvel comic uh, cover artists. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, I grew up next door to him uh, when we were kids. And That's... now he, uh, look up his work. His name's Greg Horn. Right. Like, G R E G H O R N. Fuck yeah, dude. You get uh, American Comic Principal's Office, which is fucking hilarious. I really suggest you got that out there for free right now on YouTube, right? Yeah, I, I shot that myself. And then, uh, again, you. man, timing is everything. So it was right about the time when Netflix was like, we're not going to license these. We're going to shoot them ourselves, except if you're somebody like Chappelle, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then I tried to shop it around. I got a Mickey Mouse offer. And then I said, you know what? I'm not going to take it because I, 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 I realized I couldn't, sh I couldn't share things. What really hurt me is now where the internet is, I couldn't share my half hour and learning from that experience. I didn't want to have happen that again, have that happen again. Copy that. So I wanted to be able to and be able to own it so I could share it and people wouldn't give that up. Good for you, man. I think that's smart, dude. Look at what like you're doing. The, uh, look at what guys like Andrew Schultz are doing right now. Yeah. I think it's smart. But man. see, I fucked up because I released the whole hour. So the hour is at like 1.7 million views right now, right? Sick. If I would have cut it up in 10 minute chunks, I would have had 10 videos at. What's mean? You can't do that now. Right now. You can do that now, bro. No, nah, I'm, I'm not fucking with it. The, the one I just shot in Vegas. If I don't get a good offer, because now, now because of the principal's office, it's. I built up a, a viewership that I could monetize this if I wanted to do it now on mm -hmm. my own. But people might way. like to like ingest those tiny little clips of the well, chunks. Well, I have those cut up on my site, but they're not. Once you watch the whole hour, you know, I still oh, have those cut up. But for I sure, but like if the, if people who might not commit, like, because obviously people like myself or comments watch the whole hour. But the more casual fan, if they just see a five or ten minute clip or something, then maybe they watch that, and then that will make them want to watch the whole hour. Or no? Well, dude, it's uh, it's um, it's a lesson learned. So the next one I just shot, I would cut up and, and just release it in increments, and then, and then put the have, whole uh, that then put sense. the whole thing online later on. <laughs> but what I did was I built out a site. So there's a book you should any artist should read. It's called A Thousand True Fans. And it was about this independent band in Virginia, I believe, in like 09 they made it. It's a, it's a small, read, easy read. But the concept was if they could get $100 from 1,000 fans a, a year, they could make 100 grand and make a living. So I was in the nightclub business before I got to stand up. And I know the concept was, you know, if we don't get you at the door, we're going to get you at the bar. So if I lift your cover, regardless, I'm getting your 10 bucks. Uh huh. Yeah. Right? You're yeah. going to spend it on a drink. You're, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I got a website. It's Brett Comedy, Brett with one T, comedy.com, and people could go there and they can watch the special for free. And if they want to buy it, they can own it for five bucks. Uh, I really wanted their emails, which I got. And then um, if they want to buy a t shirt, they can get a t shirt and the download for 20 bucks. Dude, that's sick. Or they could just hit play. I think that this it. is huge right now for people like. If you're lucky enough to have some money in the bank or you still got your job or you're not like fucking completely biting it from this coronavirus, go out there and support artists, man. Like that five yeah. bucks will make a huge difference to people like you and others. 20 bucks, get the t-shirt, get the special, all that. Because we can't, you're not, you can't tour right now. You can't fucking go and do your live shows. And listen, I know that you're fucking, everybody, um, everybody's in a tough spot, but Everybody is talking right now about, oh, what, what, are you, what are you doing to pass yeah. the time? Guess what they're doing? They're consuming your art. And fucking, they want it for free. They Everybody, well, if it's on Netflix or that. But, like, how valuable is that we're seeing now to be able to fucking turn something on that can well, lift your spirits? Well, the thing, too, is that if, if they watch it, and what I meant about get them at the bar, if I don't get them at the door, even if they don't buy it, They'll eventually buy a ticket to see yeah, me live. So yeah. eventually it pans out. Yeah. You know? That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, man. Because you're a funny dude. People need to go out there and support you, dog. And I know that you already Thanks. got like this huge like fucking following of fans, but. Huge huge is a strong word. Well, let's say. <laughs> a good amount. 
Well, now with people like Rogan and shit out there, like, yeah, he, he's got a huge following. There's a, there's a difference between huge. Yeah, yeah. I'm, about, I'm about six inches, moderate girth, average. <laughs> you're not going to laugh at it. Painfully average. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not going to laugh at it, but you're not going to write home about it. It's, it is what it is. Hey, dude, you're in fucking Cobra Kai. You're fucking doing your shit. Like, it could be a lot worse, bro. Oh, I'm not complaining at all, buddy. I mean, listen, I... I, I put the work in. I'm ready to keep putting the work in, and you know, you just keep keep moving forward, man, and 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 let let life take you, you know. So what's that like? Again, I know we talked about it a little before, but like working with Ralph Macchio, you're again, you're back on set. Uh, tell me a little bit about. A lot of people don't know the guys that that did Harold and Kumar, and who did. Um, Harold and Kumar and Hot Tub Time Machine are the ones that wrote it and directed it. And Will Smith's uh, production company produces it as well because he bought the uh, intellectual property. Remember when he remade it with his kid? Uh, Oh, wow. That makes so much sense. Okay. So to get involved with the project in itself, you know, outside of just the project was dope. But, I mean, it's again, it's a childhood thing, man. I mean, I'm staring there at Johnny and, and, and Ralph. Daniel LaRusso... And you're staring there going, holy shit. I mean, it's, you can check that off the wrestling and now now the Karate Kid. That's sick. But to, and then now I'm, what's even more crazier is, like, I'm part of the LaRusso family. Yeah, right? Because right. well, you play, Lu- I play like Louie, right? Louis. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the guy in Karate Kid 2, remember? The mom is her – Uncle Louie is in the bed. And he's dying. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's my father. Oh, all right. Okay. So then I come to work at the car dealership. That's so – oh, my God. You work at the car – that's right. Dude, that's so dope. Okay. See, I'm like – I've seen a couple episodes, but I'm like – Yeah, it's hard, man. You got to watch the whole series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, It's weird how YouTube did it too. Like, you know, I think they outbid Netflix for it. And then I don't know if it's even advertised or I don't know how they're doing it now. But I mean, I see it out there. It's – um. I see it, man. I mean, they're getting it out there, but that's fucking, that's sick, dude. So you, (laughs) you're working at the fucking car dealership, dude. I mean, that's pretty fucking iconic. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm at the house. I'm I'm this, uh, it's crazy too. In season one, like I pick his mom up. I'm working with his mom, you know, the mom from, it's just, it's just crazy to be now, like for all the Karate Kid fans, because there's like a huge um, internet following. Like people oh, that are like obsessed yeah. with the show, oh, with the yeah. movie. Hell yeah, man! Um, and now the show has a following too, which is which is cool. But it's almost whatever it's called in the the whole Karate Kid series or whatever. I'm now part of a character in that series. You know, like a Boba Fett or some shit. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's dope, man. Good for you, man. I'm happy for you, dog. That's fucking awesome. That's Thanks, fucking man. awesome. So uh, tell me a little bit about Dominic Witness Infection. That's supposed to be coming out soon, or uh, yeah, they just well again everything slowed up now because yeah. of this. But they were was supposed the to be at a thing. Principal uh, photography done. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, was principal photography done? Oh yeah, no, it's done. It's edited everything. They were going to premiere it at the. Uh, it was either South by Southwest or one of the other ones. It's with uh, Joe Michelle Melian from Mad TV and. Um, uh, Carlos Alzaquera, but from Reno 911. Uh, uh, they actually wrote it and produced it, but there's like a lot of comics and people from Reno 911 and a bunch of, you know, it's it's an independent comedy, but it's done. We just, they weren't able to really premiere it. I play a uh, decent role, good role. Yeah. You know, by the way, we in uh, my first CSI New York tracksuit, weeds tracksuit. Um, witness infection <laughs> tracksuit, and even in Cobra Kai, there's a scene where I wear a fucking tracksuit. <laughs> so, dude, like you, uh, I mean, I'm always in a fucking tracksuit, man. Do they have you had like producers try and tell you like do the like with the tongue like they want that on they want that on Only film for the Kesha video? The guy wanted me specifically <laughs> to do that. <laughs> That's fucking great, dude. I, I mean, yeah, man, you are kind of it's great. I see that. Um, with Joey Diaz a lot too, man. Like look at yeah, Joey Uncle Joey's Diaz. my boy, man. Fucking love that man, bro. Love that. Dude, man. I got a great group of friends. You know, 
And this is my beef with a lot of the right wing people where they always talk about Hollywood, this and that. There's some good fucking people in Hollywood. Man. Yeah, there really is. There really are, man. And, and, and I'll tell you, a lot of those liberals are, uh, you know, they always talk about how they're not as fucking mean and as everybody makes them out to be. And vice versa on the other side, too. But I'm saying there's a lot of good people in Hollywood. But there's some bitch ass motherfuckers there too, man. Fuck yeah. So my, I choose, I choose, I choose my friends and and all the guys I hang with at the comedy store that I'm there. They're all a great bunch of guys and girls, man. You know, and I've got I've got friends for life, man. I got friends for life. And the the minds too, like you know, like I'm really good friends with like Neil Brennan and uh, Bill Burr, uh, Verzi's one. Burr. Sam Tripoli. I don't know if you know who Sam is. Sam's great, man. Love Sam. Uh, He's a conspiracy Sebastian, theorist. Sebastian, Mike Young, Brian Callen. When, when you're in the back, Ian Edwards, uh, Owen Smith. I'm, I'm thinking now of all the people in the bar. These are all killers. We hang out in the back. The conversations are phenomenal. Uh, right? The, the arguments are phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um What's They're it like just, hanging out there at the comedy store, man? We're around like oh, the I've been golden there since era. like 99, bro. I've been there. I got made in 2000, February 2000. But it was kind of like a, it was a little bit slower. And then like yeah. Rogan started coming back, right? Because they were, had a whole beef with him and, and Carlos, I think it was. Or, or I don't know if that was connected. Here's what him. happened, man. And, you know, that th- those years, there was a time when everybody made fun of the store. But... Those our our comedians, the Rogans, the Diaz's, Sebastian, Tripoli's, guys. There was uh, we could go to any room, man. We could perform in any because we would be up. There'd be fifteen, twenty people in the audience at one o'clock in the morning, right? Nobody came there. That's why the success of the store is bittersweet to me because I love that my club. That's I was there. I've been there twenty three years almost. Damn right. Impressive, bro. 21. Doesn't matter. Whatever. Um, I've mm-hmm. been there over 20 years. And there was a time when nobody came there. All these comics that are trying to perform there now used to shit on the place. But how it became so big, okay, is because this, when the store was the store, not saying it's not the store anymore, but it's it's different now. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's sold out every night. It's it's like one of the best clubs. The talent is phenomenal. It'd be a Tuesday, and you got like five of the top ten best comedians on the fucking planet there. It's like now picture now all that talent with nobody in the in the crowd. One o'clock in the morning, people getting in fist fights. Uh, it was just the the, yeah, the, the inmates ran the asylum. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, I get it. And guys like Rogan and and you know everybody explained it. It was like a fucking clubhouse that nobody came to. I did the high school analogy. We're like the improv comedy club at that time. We're like the student council kids. Um, the comedy store were like the kids that uh, went to jail, graduated high school, but still hung out at the parties. Right. It was just so dysfunctional. I can't even explain how dysfunctional it was. And then the Laugh Factory kids were like those kids that could go to any party. Yeah. yeah, like yeah. They, they, they were just there. Okay. Because the Laugh Factory was run like a real, like it would have three shows. It was sold out. Then it would be four comics, next show, four comics, next show. The improv was more showcase. You had all like the Zach Galifianakis, Sarah Silverman's, you know, they were performing there. But there was like all the industry was always at the improv. Nobody came to the comedy store. <laughs> and we just used to sit up there for 15 minutes and just fucking pack. Was this when Mitzi was still running shit? Yeah, Mitzi was still around. Um, Eddie Griffin was doing three hours. Oh God. I heard Dice, those stories Dice was there. I mean, it was just, it was great, man. I can't explain it. It was just great. So the success of the comedy store, and this is my opinion. Okay. I think it was because of Mark Maron's podcast, Bill Burr's podcast, Joe Rogan's podcast really blew it up because he would have guys on like Brian Callen and Burt Kreischer and uh, Tom Segura, uh, all these Ari guys Shafir. that nobody fucking knew about, mm-hmm. and and we were all at the store, and he would tell stories about the store, and you would hear that on Marin's podcast. You know Duncan and Trussell, of course. Duncan, fucking all right, love that man. He, he was the door guy. He booked there for door a while, guy. right? He's, right. No, he's he the one there. that 
So it was actually Freddie Soto's wife was Corey. She was the original booker when, when I first started doing mics there. So I got, I got, I got uh, recommended. I performed. Mitzi saw me and said, you got to call Duncan. So, oh, uh, so Corey left. Duncan took over as the talent booker. He literally used to go alphabetically. That was it. Oh, dude. So serious. that's money for you. So Mitzi goes, uh, Mitzi goes, um, yeah, call called, called Duncan tomorrow. I liked your set. So the next day I called Duncan. I said, hey, Mitzi told me to call you. And he goes, oh, yeah, hey. He goes, uh, do you have a truck? I go, what? He's like, you got a truck? We, we need help moving. Mitzi said, you look like you could move. Help us move. <laughs> and I go, are you fucking kidding me? I thought you liked my set, man. And he goes, I'm just playing, man. She said to make you a paid regular. Oh, that's dope. That's cool. Yeah, but I. Because uh, there was that, shit like that going on, though, right? Where she'd be like, hey, come help me out. I need some Mitzi, help. Okay. <laughs> Listen, most people that that talk about Mitzi never talk to Mitzi. Yeah. As, I mean, more towards the end, yeah, it, it got really bad. But there was a time where everybody, she knew exactly what the fuck was going on, man. I remember one time she was in the room. And when you went up in front of Mitzi, you didn't, it, it was weird. And here's why. If you went up and she saw you have a great set, but it was the same set she'd seen before, you won't get spots. Mm. And she'd be like, you're not using the stage right. Right? Mm. So when you go up sometimes, you want to do new material, but if it doesn't hit. So I tried to go up, I did this set, and I worked this new bit that I was doing about, it was corny as fuck. I just threw it in there. Mitzi goes, come here. And I go, what? Swear on everything. She goes, that one joke you did, Johnny Sanchez did that joke in 96. That's all she said. So I'm like, I said, okay, I didn't know. So I went to Johnny Sanchez. I go, Johnny, did you do this joke in 96? And he's like, I don't think so. Then he went, oh, yeah. Like she remembered his the fucking joke. Yeah, she was on top of her shit. There's she remembered a reason all why. the jokes. Yeah. Yeah, that's fucking nah, man, dope. She was great, man. I was very honored to be one of the few that was passed by her. and She would talk to me about comedy. That's and huge, bro. That's so huge. I mean, talk about your lifelong, like you said, your accomplishments, the check marks on your... I mean, well, to get well, the pass from Well, that's why Missy? I moved to LA is to go to the comedy store, man. I was obsessed with it. Because I was obsessed with Dice and Kinnison as a kid. Oh. And that they're they're like they were always uh, it just I just researched it knew about the comedy store man. That's sick, dude. Who's the biggest celebrity you've met who turned out to be an awesome person? Roddy Roddy Piper. Roddy Roddy Piper, hands down. Fuck yeah. I mean, I, well, the biggest celebrity I met uh, to me, I don't know. It, it was Piper, man. Uh, I mean, Vince Vaughn was phenomenal, but he was my friend. I mean, you know, it's like. I'm friends with these guys, yeah. so it's it's a little different. It's not like we're almost the same age. You know, it's it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, Piper is the only celebrity I ever met that I was in awe of and just turned out to be the most uh, – the best guy on the planet, man. I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't explain to you what a good man he was. I love hearing that. You know who else is a great guy? It's Sandler. Adam oh. Sandler is a great guy, man. I've heard that, dude. The, what he does for his friends, all his movies, it's all his buddies. And nah, man. he's a good dude, man. I, I met him twice, and I doubt he'd remember me, but the both times I met him, he was just such such a nice guy, man. Genuinely nice. It's not like that fake humble. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. just a regular, regular dude. I love hearing that. Um, nah, man. I have no bad experiences with any... Major, but I don't really. I can't explain it. It's not like you're not going out there chasing him or anything. I just know how it's similar with me. Like I just working at radio stations and shit. They just kind of come around and it just happens. Or you're going to events where they're there and like it just. It's not like you're chasing them, but it just kind of happens. And I imagine out in L.A. I, like I've heard a lot of bad things about um, Gene Simmons. I'm not even gonna lie. I've heard a lot of people say that guy's like a a prick. It's not that I'm trying to stir anything up, just like, you know, it's, no, it's a legit identif question. I mean, identifying. I'm, I'm, I'm answering it honestly. Uh, I would tell you that every t everybody I've met, I've met on an equal playing field. So there wasn't a, um, you know, I've never really had any problems with anybody, man. I mean, everybody's, everybody I met seemed pretty cool. Dope. Um, I love it. 
I, I, there was a producer guy I met one time, but I couldn't tell you his name, but apparently he was the son of somebody. Mm. And I, I almost put him through the fucking wall. <laughs> Wait until my dad finds out about this. And you're like, yeah, okay, I don't, I don't give a fuck, man. This, this kid was so goddamn annoying. Sometimes people need to get an ass. Just them. mad disrespectful, man. Mad disrespectful. And, and it wasn't even towards me. It was towards uh, somebody that was working at the bar that my friend owned. See, that's funny that you say that because you could see I could sit there and get pissed or whatever about something you're doing. But when you start fucking around with the people that I care about or not even that, just people around me, I don't like bullies, especially bullies that got nothing to fucking back it up. It well, this dude, these, re- these dudes were nerd. They're, nerds can be bullies. This guy's a mm-hmm. fucking nerd, man. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, he, he was a bully. And I wasn't going to hit him because I, I knew I could. Like, like I would rather fight somebody. I would rather lose to somebody I know I couldn't beat than beat somebody I know I could beat. Ah, does that make sense? Yes, it does. I got you. And this guy was just drunk, and he was fucking. I mean, just had these two girls with him that that you know were they were dimes, but they were like uh, L.A. dimes, which in my opinion is a natural six to me. You know, mm-hmm. I, I I can't stand. It's obvious what they're doing. I they're, I didn't find them attractive at all. And he was just it. being so fucking rude to the kid behind the bartender. But it was just like, you could just tell that this kid is comes from money. Affluenza. But, you know, he's one of those limousine liberals that, that I call in Hollywood, where yeah. they're like, fucking the government's all fucked up as they're doing blow. Yeah. And, and <laughs> you know, you know they, they never worked a day in their life. Uh-huh. And the kid had just started mouthing off. Oh. And I asked him very nicely. I said, hey, man, do yourself a favor. There I go, go, you know, talk to that guy with a little respect to the bartender because he can't say anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then that's when he started fucking going in and he started saying, you know who my father is? And I'm like, uh, where are we, in Brooklyn? Uh, that's usually, ta- usually gangsters kids do that. That's that's so bitch, dude. You know who my yeah, father is. Yeah, and I couldn't is. even tell you. He's, you know what made it even worse is uh, I know – Story. He told me, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know who that is. I wasn't even trying because I couldn't tell you. I wish uh, I could tell you who the guy was. Listen, man. Like, um, again, we have to share this planet with a lot of different people, bro. Some of them are awesome, and some of them just suck, dude. So we gotta find a way to do it. But tell me, tell me about the time. When you laugh the hardest, I kind I kind of steal this question from Pete Holmes, Sweetie Petey. I love Pete Holmes, um, and he asked this of his guests. Well, tell me about the time when you laugh the hardest. It could be when you're younger. It could be yesterday. It doesn't have to be a fantastic story, but like when I you mean, just were crying, you couldn't get your breath. me and my little brother. We I could say that this was the longest. Okay. Um, but I, there's times cause me, it's only my, my kids I grew up with. Sebastian can make me laugh, like, but on, on a friend level, you mm-hmm. know, where like, and my buddy Luke is the same way where I, I mean, there's countless times where I've been out of breath, but there was one time. So me and my little brother, uh, he's, you know, he's, he's like my best friend. We're only three years different. I'm the older one, but mm-hmm. we're just so tight. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he bought me this, we love like generic shit. Like, you know, like the generic version of something. Like, if we see it, we're crying. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know? All right. So, for um, for my birthday, he bought me this thing called <laughs> Magic Max. And uh, it was like a generic Harry Potter meets um, meets uh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> okay. Dude, it was so awful. So, we were crying watching the movie, right? <laughs> And then we went online to see this behind the scenes, like if it was online. And they had pictures. And dude, I can't even do it justice. It was like three hours. The whole the whole session went three hours. People went to eat at something out of the fridge, and we he's like, "I'm in here. Look at this. Look at this." And then we just start, start crying all over again. That was probably the longest. That was the longest and hardest I laughed. Uh, that's it was just from the movie. Because then my brother's really, really funny, man. So he's doing like what the actors were thinking. Before, like he'd pause it mm-hmm. and be like, all right, guys. What's we're their gonna motivation take it from the going into the scene and shit? Yeah, so we started, we started imitating what was going on. And then when we went online and we saw the pictures, dude, 
<laughs> I was crying. The behind the scenes. Uh, I was fucking crying, man. One of the characters was at craft services, and I just, I, I mean, dude. <laughs> Uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about because you're seeing them. They're working so hard to sell you on this story and shit. And then you're getting to see them like actually like in the wild, like at craft services yeah. doing their shit. I get it. I fucking love it. That's awesome. And the movie's just so awful. Do you remember what's called? Max, Magic Max or Magic Max and mm-hmm. the Sorcerer's Stone or something like It was just so Sounds mad. like a fucking porn, dude. You sure you weren't watching a porn? It was Magic VHS, Ma- man. Magic Max no, and the oh, Sorcerer's dude. Bone. The special effects, the, everything from top. I mean, look, it, you feel bad because you know it was somebody's passion project. <laughs> well, God, it was so funny. And and uh, right now, like me and my friends, we text mama jokes with other comics all the time. And I'll start dying laughing at dinner or something. My wife used to get so mad. I love it, dude. This fucking beautiful. Bro, you are like one of the easiest interviews ever, bro. For real, I really enjoyed it, man. You're I'm good. Bored. That's why you're good. <laughs> you're, you're a good dude, dude. I, I've been pleasantly like, you know, people have uh, expectations of people. I really like to try and you want people to rise to the occasion. Give them the benefit of the doubt, yeah, and let them rise to the occasion. And sometimes you get let down. Other times you're like, wow, what a fucking good person. And. uh yeah, man, I really enjoyed my time with you, dog. You seem like a really level-headed, fucking good dude. Like, um, you're there for moms, you're there for the family. You're not trying to take yourself too seriously. You're trying to uh, live your How truth. How the fuck can you, man? I, I, nobody should, man. I mean, I know doctors don't. <laughs> right. Right. I'm serious. Like, you, you talk to people in, in emergency situations, and and you know, they they take what they do seriously. But you know, I mean. Well, I appreciate it, man. I'm not good at taking compliments. So I know. You. Neither am I. That's why I try and make sure that I give them to you, dog, because you but need to hear them. we're definitely going to hang, man. We're definitely going to hang, because I'll be down here for a while, man, until, until I get get my shit up and going where I need to get going. So Fuck yeah, dude. Well, let's yeah, drink to something. I'll definitely want to check out the field. I, I'm not I'm not going to be drinking. I, I like to eat, man. Oh, they got that, good it's drinker. really good, really good food there, man. Really good food. It's a real pleasure, man. Thank you for taking the time. And we'll check in soon. Give uh, my best to mom and the rest of the family and hang in there, brother. I appreciate it, man. Thanks again, dude. Keep your head up, dude. We'll talk soon. All right. Thanks, man. See ya. All right, buddy. Later.